Good morning. Welcome to Sky News Breakfast. Thank you for joining us. The number of COVID-19 cases may be starting to gradually slow down, but for paramedics, there's no let-up in the pressures they're facing. Sky News has spent 48 hours on the front line with the Welsh Ambulance Service. And while its staff are still treating people with the virus, they're also having to deal with increasing numbers of patients who are finding the pandemic has affected their mental health. This from Tom Parmenter, his special report. Everyone has had enough. But they just keep going. Ambulance! The COVID cases are gradually slowing down. But the next wave in North Wales is this. When she's been found collapsed in the street, she is possibly an overdose. Uh, really sadly, it sounds like she's lost her dad to COVID quite recently, which has probably uh, really brought her to this state that she's in now. When we get to the Myla Hospital in Wrexham, the patient refuses to go in. There's now something of a gentle standoff between the security at the hospital here and the paramedics and the patient who just doesn't want to go inside. It's a difficult, delicate job that they have. After almost an hour, she's guided in for specialist care. Uh, her, her family member had passed away last night with COVID and just unable to cope with the situation at the moment, really. And it's on every shift, sometimes for the full 12 hours. Some shifts we, we can see um, every patient will have some element of mental health, whether that was the primary reason for the call or not. Um, that makes it really challenging for us because we have limited ways of dealing with these things other than A&E. They're still picking up COVID patients every day, but slowly the winter tide is receding. Shirley had it in January and still isn't right. She now has chest pains. To know that you can't go anywhere, it's just, you know, and you're just there on your own, and it's, you can see why people do go, you know, go off the red, because it's just, there's nothing you can do, is you can't go nowhere, you can't, you can't do anything. If you no notice problems. that your cough is becoming, it's becoming it's really, really short of breath... Then and this is where the vast majority of people find help, with the 111 call team. Our straightforward symptoms, or what we perceived as straightforward calls to us previously, like your sore throats, even those type of calls now are coming in with some level of mental health issues. You know, patients are really anxious, um, really scared. So again, this is the, the benefit of this service, is that we can actually help and advise those patients. This isn't unique to Wales, but they are responding here. So we're certainly looking uh, to uh, enhance what we can do here in Wales, certainly in the ambulance service, to support mental health patients. And I expect to see uh, uh, more specialist mental health services within the ambulance service in the next 12 months. After every COVID job, every item on these vehicles is deep cleaned. You can get rid of coronavirus doing this, but you can't wipe away its side effects. Tom Parmenter, Sky News, North Wales. And if you're affected by any of the issues mentioned in that report, Samaritans is available 24-7. You can call them on 116 123 or email joe at samaritans.org. Those contact details on the bottom of your screen now. And if you can see a longer version of that report at these times here on Sky News. The Chancellor is warning Britain's public finances will face enormous strains in the wake of the latest lockdown. Rishi Sunak is expected to include a host of actions to kickstart the economy in Wednesday's budget, including a mortgage guarantee scheme to help aspiring homeowners. But he'll also emphasise the need to start paying back the billions borrowed for the pandemic. Well, political correspondent Rob Powell joins me now from Westminster. So some good news uh, in the budget to come, but also some bad news as well. Yeah, and I think we're probably, Gillian, getting the good news or some of the good news at least uh, this morning with a flurry of announcements from the Treasury about what we should expect in the uh, big annual uh, financial statement from the Chancellor um, on Wednesday. Uh, this mortgage guarantee scheme, which will run from April, uh, essentially will um, allow 95% mortgage 
mortgages. So mortgages where people don't have to put as much cash up front as a deposit. They vanished from the market during the pandemic. The government wants to get them back. They will be available up to £600,000. A scheme similar, but not exactly the same um, as the Help to Buy scheme that has run um, in previous years. There's also an announcement today about added flexibility being put into traineeship and apprenticeship schemes with some extra money as well. Also news about a fast track visa for uh, certain companies too. So the Chancellor, I think, will want to talk about the good side of um, what's to come, about boosting the economy and about measures he's going to put in place to do that. But I, I think the main uh, meat of the budget is still going to be around the pandemic. And that's what he's getting at in his interview with the Financial Times um, overnight, talking about how there will be more help to come. I think what that means in practice is potentially extensions of things like the furlough scheme, maybe the business um, rate um, relief uh, as well, and potentially an extension of the universal credit uplift. But Rishi Sunak also saying that he will need to level with the public about how they are going to put public finances back on a stable footing. Uh, and I think essentially what that means is perhaps we will get an indication, if not an immediate imposition, uh, of tax rises. Rob, thank you. Police and military in northern Nigeria have launched a rescue operation after 317 girls were kidnapped at gunpoint from a boarding school. The Nigerian president, Mohamedou Buhari, has said his government won't give in to blackmail. It's the latest in a series of student abductions in the country. Milena Veselinovic reports. It's a place where they should have been safe. But more than 300 girls were abducted from their boarding school in northwest Nigeria, taken from their dormitories at night. Among them were Yunus Mohamed's four daughters. Daddy called me, tell me the situation. We tried to come by that time. The exchanging fire between that robot and the uh, soldier couldn't give us time to enter. Then we go back. Large groups of armed men operate in this area. They kidnap for ransom, and Nigerian police and army say they are now hunting them. We are on the trail of the kidnappers. That's why you find us in the fringes of the forest here. It's part of our locational effort and it's part of our cordoning effort. It's been nearly eight years since the terror group Boko Haram abducted 276 schoolgirls, causing global outrage. More than 100 of them never returned home. And since then, schools have become common targets for mass kidnappings. Just last week, 42 people, including 27 pupils, were taken from a science college in Niger State. And in December, 344 boys were abducted from a secondary school in northern Katsina State. They were later released, but aid agencies say that the situation is deteriorating. People are getting used to being able to uh, undertake something like this. The horrific consequences of not only being taken now, but the consequences are compounded by the fact that the parents might not send their girls back to school if they're released, and other parents might withdraw their girls uh, from school. For families of missing girls, an agonizing wait begins in the hope of getting their daughters back. Milena Veselinovic, Sky News. Tiger Woods' family have issued an update on his condition after he was involved in a car crash in L.A., they say he's had to undergo follow-up procedures after surgery for two open fractures and a shattered ankle following the accident earlier this week. The 15-time major champion is said to be in good spirits. It's not yet known whether his injuries will mean an end to his golfing career. Lady Gaga's two French bulldogs have been found safe and unharmed after being stolen at gunpoint two days ago. The pop star had offered a half a million dollar reward for their return after her dog walker, Ryan Fisher, was shot in Hollywood on Wednesday. He's expected to make a full recovery. CCTV footage has captured the moment a woman was dragged by a car down a street in California after her purse was stolen. The incident follows a series of attacks and robberies against people of Asian descent in the San Francisco Bay Area. Police say the robbery is under investigation. A Second World War era plane will soar over Captain Sir Tom Moore's funeral service later today in honour of the veteran. 
Sir Tom, who raised more than £32 million for NHS charities, died at Bedford Hospital earlier this month at the age of 100, shortly after testing positive for COVID-19. British Army officers have volunteered to mentor NHS leaders to help them respond to the pandemic. More than 130 members of NHS England have been given advice on leadership, dealing with uncertainty, decision-making and planning under pressure. Well, Lieutenant Colonel Joanna Muntz is a British Army officer at Sandhurst who helped develop the mentoring programme. She joins us now from Tidworth in Wiltshire. Good morning to you. Uh, first of all, where did the idea for this mentoring scheme uh, come from? Where were you approached initially? Yeah, so if I just might start by saying that from my own perspective and on behalf of the mentors involved, it's been an absolute privilege to be able to support um, such dedicated, capable and hardworking NHS leaders throughout this challenging time. I think it was probably March last year when we were all just beginning to acknowledge the enormity of this crisis, um, when the NHS started to think of ways in which they might best support their leaders through this. Um, and given the Army's reputation for operating under crisis situations and our reputation for excellent leadership, the NHS reached out to us to see what we might be able to offer in support. Obviously, we were humbled as an organisation to be approached and delighted that we could assist. How exactly has the, the mentoring project been, been working? So um, we've had um, army leaders volunteer from around the world, wherever they're based, and they have been providing leadership, leading through crisis mentorship to NHS leaders. And that has spanned the ranks um, from the executive level, lieutenant generals in the army, mentoring the NHS's most senior leaders, through to our middle management, um, our most senior soldiers, our regimental sergeant majors, managing their equivalents in the NHS. Uh, and what would you say has, has been the benefit um, of, of this scheme? What, what sort of results ha have you seen? So the feedback through the mentors has suggested that um, not only have the NHS benefited from this programme, but the army mentors have found it incredibly value valuable too. Um, from the NHS individual perspective, they've reported back that they had increased self-awareness. So that's the awareness of their, how their leadership style affects the team around them. They've reported back that they've had improved confidence. Um, and not least really, the sessions have provided them a confidential space to really um, get to the bottom of their issues and really reflect on their priorities, which has enabled them to create a plan going forward. And also the mentors have offered um, a sounding board a listening ear and just enabled the mentees to unburden their day. Obviously, this has come about because of the pandemic and has been seen as a way to help uh, NHS staff through the pandemic. But do you see it as something that might continue? Um, I think that um, absolutely the amount that we can learn from other, gov other government departments and other organisations is endless. And I think it's been really valuable for um, both the NHS and the Army to understand a bit more about each other's organisation um, throughout this mentoring programme. And I think that we will learn from that, that it's a really valuable thing to do. Uh, and no doubt personal bonds will have been uh, formed, um, friendships um, forged from this, this situation. Absolutely. I've had um, senior army officers that have been leaving the army during the course of the programme and have been in touch with me to say, is it OK to keep this mentoring relationship going? And, and absolutely, on a personal level, that's fine. OK, looking forward to that continued relationship. Uh, and uh, we thank you for your service and all the help that you have been offering to the NHS through this pandemic. Lieutenant Colonel Joanna Muntz, thank you. Thank you. A restaurant in New York has come up with a novel way to make the dining experience a little less lonely as COVID restrictions remain in place. Brooklyn's famous Peter Luger Steakhouse has borrowed figures from the local Madame Tussauds to fill the two thirds of the indoor space still unavailable to customers. So diners can now sit with Audrey Hepburn and enjoy breakfast at Tiffany's or have a drink next to everyone's favorite ad executive, Don Draper, also known as John Hamm from Mad Men. Who would you want to sit next to? Isabel. Uh, Stephen Dixon. <laughs> <laughs> That's not
so good. You can sit next to him any time. <laughs> he might be watching. Are you watching? Is he watching? Who Probably. <laughs> um, Weather-wise, it's lovely. Lots of sunshine today. It's a beautiful, beautiful morning. It's cold out there, though. Let's take a look. Look forward to brighter skies. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. It's coldest in the south this morning where we've had clear skies overnight, minus four in Oxford, but it's beautifully sunny. Just a little bit of mist and fog in the southwest that shouldn't take too long to lift. Northwestern areas, though, have got this weak front that's giving some drizzly rain across parts of uh, Donegal through Northern Ireland into southwest and western Scotland. This area of cloud here will push a little bit further south through the day into northern areas of the Irish Sea, maybe. Uh, Southeast Scotland, perhaps Cumbria, but I don't think it'll amount to much. It'll just bring some cloudier weather southwards, skies then brightening up further north. And as you can see, for the majority of us, though, it is fine, dry and sunny, with temperatures up to about 10 to 13 degrees. Not bad at all. Where you keep clear skies tonight, there'll be a frost again, but I think there'll be a bit more in the way of cloud, mist and fog. Still fed extensive cloud of where that old front lies, and a bit more in the way of fog around more eastern and southeastern coasts. So it could be grey with you first thing, then again, sunshine becomes more white spread a lovely Sunday more in the way of cloud though by Monday the weather sponsored by Qatar Airways still to come Jamie will have all your sport for you morning I still have a bit of sunshine back it here. is very nice I had the shorts and t-shirt on yesterday ice cream no, we don't need to know that yeah. <laughs> that's the Irishman for you the second the sun comes out short t-shirt ice cream um, but if you want to break from the lovely sunshine there's lots of sport you can sit indoors and watch today including the Six Nations Rugby it's back this weekend not for Scottish fans mind you their trip to France tomorrow is off after a Covid outbreak in the home squad England's match with Wales though does go ahead in Cardiff but can England cope without this man Courtney Laws will be hearing from both head coaches and they are just relentless at the moment, Manchester City. Can they make it 20 successive wins in all competitions? This lunchtime, we're looking ahead to their match against West Ham. Our job is to tell the truth. This is a forgotten front line. They are dying here. Here it comes. Boy, we've got some interesting ways of showing you what's going on. Their message to us, get ready. Not the lack of problems. Instructing you to stay at home. I can't believe we did that. It's pretty special, isn't it? Good morning, it's 7.30. You're watching Sky News Breakfast. The number of COVID-19 cases may be starting to gradually slow down, but for paramedics, there's no let-up in the pressures they're facing. Sky News spent 48 hours on the front line with ambulance staff in North Wales. And while they were still treating people with the virus, they were also having to deal with increasing numbers of patients bearing mental scars from the pandemic. This is Tom Parmenter's special report. Golf 300, good morning. Another 12-hour shift. Ambulance. They're picking up the victims of the virus and the victims of lockdown. Shirley had COVID in January. Now her daughter has had to call for help again. Uh, she's got pains in her chest. Um, but we'll see what we'll see what they say. Hopefully she'll be all right. And it's, uh, COVID's still with us, isn't it? It's kind of... yeah, it wants to do one now. <laughs> it does. <laughs> it's doing be edit. And to know that you can't go anywhere, it's just, you know, and you're just there on your own. And it's, you can see why people do go, you know, go off the red because... It's just, there's nothing you can do, is you can't go nowhere, you can't, you can't do anything. My name's Kieran McLellan, I'm a paramedic in Wrexham Ambulance Station. I'm Vicky Moran, I'm an emergency medical technician for um, Welsh Ambulance Service and I'm based in Wrexham Station. I've not really known much difference. I'm only 18 months into the role and there's colleagues of 30 odd years who are saying it's the most challenging time they've ever seen and they're struggling and questioning their question their roles. Uh, I've never seen so many poorly patients in a small amount of time. I think that's not take its toll on anybody, never mind paramedic. It's harder for family because family um, worry about me. They worry about me more than I worry about myself. Um, so I think that's what you find hard is, you know, they'll ask, you know, have you had COVID jobs today? Well, yeah, we get COVID jobs nearly every day. Um, 
so yeah, they they do worry. Family do worry. The house is currently declared as a red zone due to COVID. Red level PPE it is. I've got to go in the back and do it. Even though the patient they're seeing has previously tested negative for COVID-19, there are other residents here who are positive, and so everything moves up a level. These COVID jobs are thankfully slowing down, but this isn't. Well, she's been found collapsed in the street. She is possibly an overdose. And uh, really sadly, it sounds like she's lost her dad to COVID quite recently, which has probably uh, really brought her to this state that she's in now. When we get to the Myler Hospital in Wrexham, the patient refuses to go in. There's now something of a gentle standoff between the security at the hospital here and the paramedics and the patient who just doesn't want to go inside. It's a difficult, delicate job that they have. After almost an hour, she's guided in for specialist care. Uh, her, her family member had passed away last night with COVID and just unable to cope with the situation at the moment, really. And it's on every shift, sometimes for the full 12 hours. Some shifts we, we can see um, every patient will have some element of mental health, whether that was the primary reason for the call or not. Um, that makes it really challenging for us because we have limited ways of dealing with these things other than A&E. They're equally limited. They see medical patients on top of those mental health patients, so they have to weigh up the priority if there's no main medical concern. It's purely a wait for the mental health teams here and there's not enough staff, unfortunately. In the queue at the Myla Hospital, are soldiers helping out on ambulances. They've been on deployment since Christmas. We're not heroes or nothing like that. We're just here to help. That's it. I was opened my eyes quite a lot because obviously you didn't think it was as bad as it was. But when, you, when you're on there and your ambulances going to these houses, seeing the people, seeing what it's done to them, you think, yeah, that's quite bad. Um, if you notice that your cough is becoming, becoming really, really short of breath, then I've... And this is where the vast majority of people find help with the 111 call team. Our straightforward symptoms, or what we perceived as straightforward calls to us previously, like your sore throats, even those type of calls now are coming in with some level of mental health issues. You know, patients are really anxious, um, really scared. So again, this is the, the benefit of this service is that we can actually help and advise those patients. He did state that he's normally fit and well. He's just concerned about COVID. So there is an impact on the nation there with the mental health and everything's going on. And, you know, services have adapted out there. But I think one of the biggest challenges is basically looking after the staff as well as doing everything else, making sure that the staff are OK. The next job is Claire, who's collapsed at home with very low blood pressure. It's linked to a pre-existing condition. Yeah, very stressful year, to be honest. Yeah. Uh, I work in the wedding industry, yeah. um, okay. and we've had such a tough year. Um, the, the stress that we've all been under with transferring thousands of weddings. <laughs> yeah. But obviously there's a roadmap out of it now, so hopefully the stress is going to go away. <laughs> Claire is still coping, but many more people of all ages are not. And so this service needs to adapt. We're certainly looking uh, to uh, enhance what we can do here in Wales, certainly in the ambulance service, to support mental health patients. And I expect to see uh, uh, more specialist mental health services within the ambulance service in the next 12 months. Yeah, Roger, thanks. Um, we'll make our way back to base. Thank you. When Kieran and Vicky finish, Mal and Andy are in full flow. Every single item on board is cleaned after a COVID patient. We don't get to know what equipment has been used on the vehicle or what medication has been used. So for all I know that it may have been opened and, and something may have been taken out of this box during the treatment, but I'm not aware of that. So better safe than sorry, you clean everything. If it's on this kit, you can wipe coronavirus away. But its side effects run deep and need just as much care. Tom Parmenter, Sky News, North Wales.
And if you've been affected by any of the issues mentioned in that report, Samaritans is available 24-7. You can call them on 116 123 or email joe at samaritans.org. Those contact details on the bottom of your screen now. And if you want to watch the full report, it'll be playing throughout the day on Sky News. The times are listed on your screen. President Biden says he will be holding Saudi Arabia's crown prince to account for human rights abuses after US intelligence services accused him of approving an operation to kill the Saudi journalist and dissident Jamal Khashoggi. He's believed to have been murdered and dismembered at Saudi Arabia's embassy in Istanbul in 2018. The Saudi foreign ministry has rejected the report's finding. Our defence and security correspondent Alistair Bunkle reports from Washington. It was long awaited, but as expected. The CIA believes that Saudi Arabia's crown prince, Mohammed bin Salman, did authorise the killing of journalist Jamal Khashoggi. In a short four-page executive summary, the intelligence agency said that it based its assessment on the crown prince's control of decision-making in the kingdom, the direct involvement of a key advisor and members of Mohammed bin Salman's protective detail in the operation, and the crown prince's support for using violent measures to silence dissidents abroad, including Khashoggi. What's your reaction to the report? It's a historic moment, this, uh, and makes it quite clear that it leads right to the top, to the, to the Crown Prince, uh, ordering and approving this uh, horrific operation. Jamal Khashoggi went to the Saudi consulate in Istanbul on October the 2nd, 2018, to pick up papers allowing him to wed his Turkish fiancée. As she waited for him outside, he was ambushed, tortured and killed inside. Initially, Saudi Arabia denied any knowledge of his disappearance, then finally admitted he had died in a fight. <laughs> Mohammed bin Salman said that he took personal responsibility but had no knowledge of the killing. The Biden administration has announced financial and visa sanctions with the State Department banning 76 Saudis from entering America, but not Mohammed bin Salman. I spoke yesterday with the king, not the prince, made it clear to him that the rules are changing and we're going to be announcing significant changes today and on Monday. We are going to hold them accountable for human rights abuses. The Saudi government has rejected the report as negative, false and unacceptable. The relationship with, with, with Saudi Arabia is an important one. We have significant uh, ongoing interests. We remain committed to the defense uh, of the kingdom. Uh, but we also want to make sure, and this is what the president has said from the outset, that the relationship better reflects our interests and our values. President Biden isn't taking any specific action against Mohammed bin Salman. That will be controversial for some. But the White House is calculating that the very release of this report will be humiliation enough for Saudi Arabia's young crown prince. Alistair Bungle, Sky News, Washington. Time now to see what the weather's going to do to us today with Isabel. Look forward to brighter skies. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Hello, good morning. So nice not to have any weather warnings. We've got high pressure in charge, which is keeping things dry and settled for most. Having said that, there is a weak front that's giving cloudy skies through Ireland, Northern Ireland and up into southwest and central Scotland. There is some drizzly rain on this this morning and that cloud will tend to come and go a little, probably drifting a little further southwards during the day. Otherwise, though, early fog, which is fairly extensive at the moment across the west country, will clear and there'll be plenty of sunshine. Lots of blue sky to enjoy today. Temperatures up to about 10 to 13 Celsius. That's 55 Fahrenheit, a few degrees above average for this time of year. Now, as we head through this evening and tonight, the cloud becomes a little more extensive across these central and northwestern areas. A bit more in the way of mist and fog. Maybe some fog as well running through the uh, Thames estuary for tomorrow morning. So you might well wake up tomorrow morning. It's pretty grey and cold with you. But then that fog should lift and the cloud should tend to thin a little bit. And again, for many, it's a fine day. Quite breezy, mind you, for the south coast. Bear in mind, Monday will be a little different. Brightest in the west, cloudier and cooler in the east. The weather 
Sponsored by Qatar Airways. Welcome back. Uh, back with us to take us through the morning's newspapers, the journalist and broadcaster, Badisha, and the comedian, uh, Andrew Doyle. Welcome back to you both. Starting with The Express, Badisha, and uh, this story um, talking about President Biden's first military action that's been carried out. <laughs> Yeah, I don't really appreciate the Rambo reference in the in the title because it seems to lionize that kind of militarization, which actually Joe Biden gained the election by saying he wasn't like mm. that. So it's interesting that this small piece of news that shelved away on page 13, uh, American military personnel have bombed uh, some fighting units in Syria that were used by fighters backed by Iran. Uh, killing 22 fighters. And this is what they term a sort of small measured reciprocation of an attack that happened at a U.S. airbase close to Erbil Airport, which killed one contract worker. The reason I picked up the story is that for the last year or so, we've been so consumed talking about the pandemic and all the things we've lost and our inconveniences. But we forget that there are multiple countries all over the world particularly Syria, but there are many other examples that have been under a war or a siege or a fragile state situation for years now. We're edging into something like year eight of these conflicts, not to mention all the fragile states that follow wars and conflicts anyway. So the things that we in the UK have been scared of losing, civil society, social fabric, education for the young, a schooling that you can rely on, have actually all been lost by people in Syria and in many, many other countries. It's also interesting that Joe Biden really just became president, and this is one of the first things he does, a very quick military operation. Trump threatened that. He didn't do it so fast. Mm, interesting. The I, Andrew, the I weekend, uh, back to the pandemic and talking about uh, over 40s being uh, able to get the vaccine in April. They're in the next tranche. That's right. This is the uh, recommendations by the Joint Committee on Vaccination and Immunisation. Uh, what they've suggested <clears throat> is that those aged between 40 and 49 should be prioritised first, followed by people in their 30s, and then concluding with the younger age group, 18 to 29. Of course, all of this makes sense. There are uh, lots of factors to consider when it comes to COVID, things like underlying health issues and obesity uh, that can make you more susceptible to long-term damage. However, it's absolutely clear, all of the evidence is telling us that, that age is the key factor and the younger you are, the less likely it is to have an effect. By the time you're getting into the 40s and the 30s, um, the odds of, of fatality is ve are very low. However, uh, they're right to do it. It seems very sensible to me. Um, the reason it's tendentious slightly uh, is because a lot of people would rather that they were vaccinating people according to profession. So, for instance, teachers and online uh, NHS workers and the that was being done. But what the committee is saying is that that presents a particular logistical challenge, because if you're targeting certain professions, it's a more complex process and that this might end up slowing the overall rollout of the vaccine and that would leave people uh, more vulnerable for longer. And there's a quotation in the article here from Professor Wei Shen Lim, who's the COVID chair for the committee, and sa who says the current strategy is to prioritise those who are more likely to have severe outcomes and die from the disease. Sounds totally sensible for me. These are the experts. I think uh, we should let them get on with what they're doing. They seem to know what they're doing. Uh, the government does seem to be on track. It wants to have all adults vaccinated by the end of July. Uh, so there's a lot to be positive about. There's been 19 million uh, vaccines so far. The R number appears to be floating between 0.6 and 0.9. And that does mean that the epidemic is shrinking. So a lot to be positive about. Yeah, although there are some questions about whether uh, teachers in, in particular should be vaccinated um, because of the return on March the 8th. And it's something that they've said, actually, schools, they could quite easily do themselves. Uh, but we shall see. To the Times, Badisha and uh, Keir Starmer facing a, a rebellion, apparently over his views on uh, his decision, actually, whether to um, back a rise in uh, corporation tax. Yeah, this is quite interesting. Rebellion sounds like a very strong word. Uh, mm -hmm. The shadow cabinet uh, and Keir Starmer, the Labour leader, seem to be in slight opposition because uh, he is opposing projected rises in corporation tax at the moment. And this is a very non-traditional Labour thing to do. Ordinarily, Labour, red Labour, would be very much pushing forward for rises 
in a corporation tax and not just that but closing all of the many loopholes which enable business owners particularly big business those who would ordinarily pay a huge amount of tax to actually stump up and pay the tax that they owe instead of sort of defraying it or passing it off as uh, as running costs uh, what he's saying is that if there's an increase in corporation tax at this time, even though the money that's been spent on COVID and whatever else has to be brought back, it's going to put undue pressure on all sorts of businesses, not just the famous corporations that we all know about and, of course, should be paying tax. It's going to put pressure on individual smaller owned businesses who are already dealing with a lot of new Brexit red tape and COVID restrictions and wondering how their businesses are going to survive. Many other uh, shadow cabinet members have spoken out against his move. And they're in favour, not of opposing what he's doing, but of saying, OK, we need to look at this progressively. Tony Blair, who I'm not sure when he speaks up for the Labour Party, I'm not sure it really helps the Labour Party that much, has told people to cut karma, uh, cut Starmer some slack. That's a Freudian slip there, karma. Karma Starmer. Excellent. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and to just sort of let this roll out. But what we do know is that Rishi Sunak is going to be probably announcing a staggered corporation tax rise, even going up to 25%. But of course, we have to wait for the 3rd of March for Sunak to say all of these, these things that we're speculating about. Yes, that is the, the date that we are hanging on. To the Telegraph, Andrew, and this story, which seems um, quite worrying at first glance, is about foreign doctors prescribing sex change hormones to 15-year-olds in England. Yes, so you'll know that back in November, the High Court ruled that uh, clinics shouldn't be able to prescribe puberty blockers to, to young children because they're too young to consent. And there's been a lot of debate about this, mostly surrounding the Tavistock Clinic, which is an NHS clinic that focuses on gender dysphoria in, in young people. Uh, this particular study is showing that in spite of that ruling, what is happening is there are overseas doctors who are using an online service called Gender GP, and they've admitted to prescribing uh, um, puberty blockers to children as young as 10 and cross-sex hormones to children as young as 12. Cross-sex hormones can lead to um, infertility and, and irreversible changes. So and is that this is actually very consent? serious. With, with the, the children's without consent. parents' consent, because it's that's that's right, because it's a legal loophole, because it's 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 an online service from overseas, and that's why uh, they're able to do it. There's actually a quotation here from Debbie Hayton, who is a transgender rights campaigner, and she says, for a doctor to in Eastern Europe to prescribe a class three controlled drug to a child they have never spoken to is an egregious breach of protocol and safeguarding. So uh, we do need to address this. It is very, very uh, serious. However, it's also such an emotive subject. And it strikes me that uh, people are afraid to have this conversation. They really are. They steer clear because whenever anyone raises concerns about this, they're smeared as transphobic or hateful. I know a lot of people who have been in this debate. I've never seen any evidence of hate or anything like it. But I know a lot of people, you'll be surprised, who say to me, I'm just not getting involved. I have concerns, but I'm not getting involved. But actually, because of the sensitivity of the, of the issue, there's more reason for discussion and debate, uh, not less. And uh, there, are, we need to talk to everyone. We need to consider um, people who have, who, who have been through gender dysphoria, who have transitioned, and they've said that it's saved their lives. We need to talk to those people. We need to talk to people who have transitioned and said that it's ruined their lives. People like Kira Bell, who's a 23-year-old woman who, who obviously was involved in the court case back in November, and she said she had no guidance and she was uh, pressured into taking puberty blockers when she was too young. So we just need to have the conversation without all these insults being thrown uh, back and forth. And certainly when it comes to um, overseas doctors finding loopholes to bypass British law, that is something we should be talking about anyway, because obviously that can't go on. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. It is a conversation that we need to have uh, out in the open. Let's uh, end with the uh, royals, one in particular, Prince Harry. Um, he's been uh, doing a bit of rapping. This is in the star. Yes, uh, and, and not early Christmas present no. wrapping either. <laughs> the other kind, the slightly worse kind. Uh, Prince Harry has done a very eye-opening interview on top of a double-decker bus riding around Los Angeles with James Corden. It's uh, very off the hook. He, they stop outside the mansion at which The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air was filmed, as any Gen Xer knows. Somehow the theme tune is, like, branded into our memory. And, of course, Prince Harry wraps it complete with hand signals, 
and everything. It's weird. Uh, he FaceTimes with Megan, who says that her nickname for him is Has. It sounds like a very un-American way of addressing someone called Harry. Has or Hazza. Um, Prince Harry says that uh, when they put their little baby Archie down for the night, him and him and Megan uh, just go upstairs and get a takeaway yeah. and Netflix but it out. Yeah, lots, lots so being uh, revealed uh, about uh, the royal. Uh, much more to come. Thank you both for the moment. See you now. It's time.